Welcome in, folks. We're here with another special episode of I've Got a Theory with Hennish Polkal. Today, my guest is Jason Sparks, one of my good friends from University of Michigan and in college. We probably met each other in 1998 or 1999 and uh, been friends since then. So it's been over 20 years. So congrats, congrats to us for us for that reason. Yes, it's been a good 20 years, man. Yeah, so we haven't seen each other as much in the last few years, but we've been busy with families and business and stuff like that. And, and now we're in different cities, um, as opposed to when we both lived in Chicago together and got to hang out and watch Michigan football and play flag football and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, good to see you. Thank you for coming on to the show. And it's, it's interesting because as much as we had an excellent college experience, I would say, um, you know, I'm speaking on your behalf even though we were in different fraternities and stuff, we still got to interact quite a bit and had a good experience at one of the best colleges on the planet. But you've got a theory on this. Tell me more, Jason. I do. And you're right. I can easily say that I had a fantastic college experience. You, know, you and I met there at the University of Michigan and you know, the college experience has been part of you know, American life for many decades. But I, my theory is that unless there are some significant changes with how the American college system is set up, this will become a, the, the, the traditional four-year college experience will become a luxury in the not too distant future. And I, I'm thinking about even when both you and I have young kids, so even when our young kids get ready to go to college, this could be a luxury or there could be alternate paths that people take to careers rather than going to a four-year university. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, more, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think that it's going to become a luxury good? Well, there's two big pieces here. The, the one piece that people have heard about quite a bit is the cost of college is, is incredible. I mean, it, it costs more to go to college in America than pretty much anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, we've seen the debt numbers. Now it's $1.6 trillion in student debt. Um, you know, and, and looking at, you know, I was looking at, because I was interested. So when you and I went to University of Michigan, the cost for a student to go to school for in-state tuition was 12, around $12,000, and you were an in-state student, and I was an out-of-state student, and around then it was about $28,000 a year for an out-of-state yes. student. Right. Um, and even back then, that was quite expensive, you know, by standards at that time. That was, you know, in the Yeah, it was, it was double the other state colleges or more for me as a Michigan uh, resident to look at the other universities that were half or, or less. Yes, exactly. And today, if you're going to Michigan, in-state is around $28,000 or more per year, and out-of-state is about $64,000 per year. Um, and that's, with, that's with the housing included, which you're looking at the first couple of years, a lot of students live in, in student housing. But you still got to pay for it, whether you live yes. in student housing or off-campus, doesn't matter. Yes. So you're looking at, you know, the, the cost of college has dramatically increased in the past 20 years since you were in Iowa school. Um, it, it's obviously far surpassed. Um, income level increases in that time. So, you know, the, the average family, you know, a university like Michigan and many other state schools are, are just not really affordable. Um, so that, that's one of the big pieces. And the other piece is that the value of a college degree has changed dramatically as well. And I would argue that probably when you and I went to Michigan, that change was starting to kind of happen in society where in our parents' time, Going to college is pretty much a guarantee on a successful career, easy path to a good job. When you and I went to school, I think there was still a lot of value in having a degree from a, a notable university, and, and most of our friends didn't have too much trouble finding a job after school. But since that time, it's become much more challenging to take a degree and just translate it to a success, successful career. Um, so you're paying a lot more money for that degree, but the ROI can be argued that's really not there. Um, so those are two really big factors that are playing into where I think, you know, down the road, this becomes more of a, of a luxury experience for families that can afford this compared to um, what it's maybe made to be out now. Yeah. So, I, you, you know, I, I agree with your theory and I kind of looked up some interesting stuff on universities um, and, and it just got me thinking of three interesting points. One, how much do you think university administration is for or against all the movies that glamorize the party life in colleges for the last 40, 50 years, right? Going back to the animal houses and stuff like that. How many of these, you know, which at the core, 
they're against the values that parents would want their children to have. But uh, it can, conversely, those students are like, I can't wait to get to college so I can have that kind of experience. That's a great question. Great point that, you know, you look at a public university like Michigan and people say, you know, they, these are publicly funded institutions, you know, they, they're, they're not for profit. When you get down to it, I mean, these are still run like businesses. They are constantly marketing their brand in the U.S. and globally, especially at a place like Michigan, um, trying to drive more attention, more applications from students. There's even value in, 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 in applications because you have to pay for an application. So, yeah, that's even a revenue stream as well for, for university. Um, so, they, you know, while the, the good PR spin would be that they don't like these kind of movies about glamorized partying and having a good time. If you're there to study, you're there to be an academic. But I would say, but behind the scenes, and there's, you know, absolutely they, they, they can't complain that, that people, they like the college experience. And part of that is the social aspect. So that sure. is also part of what they're, you know, that's big time college sports plays into that as well. I mean, obviously universities spend a tremendous, in the U.S., spend a tremendous amount of money for college sports because that is part of their brand, that's part of attracting more students and more interest in their university. Yeah, so that brings up my next point. As much headlines as fraternities and sororities get in colleges in terms of hazing and accidental deaths or partying too much or getting in trouble, why do you think colleges put up with them? I'm asking um, rhetorically because I know the answer, but you know, I wanna know your take on it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, why do, we, why do they put up with them? Why do they say, ah, another fraternity killed another person in a hazing or drank too much or fell down the stairs, uh, but they still deal with them. They'll put them in a suspension or some kind of other penalty, but then they continue having Greek life. You're right. There's certainly a lot of liability there from a college perspective. And, and certainly in, 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 in very unfortunate circumstances can be some really bad PR if something happens to a student. Um, but when I, someone's asked me that question, I guess quite a few times I've gotten that question. And really, I look back to these institutions of sororities and fraternities, Greek life, are embedded in the DNA of, of colleges for hundreds of years. Um, and you, you look at the notable alumni, the very successful and wealthy alumni that have come through those, those communities at different colleges, um, and there's a lot of power and influence with that group of people as well. So the, the, the universities are, are very careful about how they address that community. Um, but also I think there are, there's a good portion of administrators that do see the value, the social value, the educational value of, um, in a sense, a learning community, um, of a fraternity or sorority. Cause there, there are a lot of real life skills and experiences that can be taken from being part of that organization. I think colleges still appreciate that, but again, you know, they're careful with the liabilities. That's why you see a lot more activity around um, policies and um, guidelines and education to their members and everything they can possibly do to mitigate that risk and help ensure that, you know, that, that, that there are no crazy incidents that would cause, you know. So here's, uh, here's the gist of it. You're on the right track. People, you know, they do this with surveys and it's all based on metrics. And you, and you got to the point earlier, which is, these are organizations that are concerned with the number one thing that most organizations are concerned with, which is self-preservation, one, and then two, growth, right? Because if you're not growing, you're dying. So the most important thing is, how do we stay relevant? How do we attract students? How do we attract teachers? How do we attract the best administrators? And most importantly, how do we attract, uh, attract donations? So people, the, the colleges have found out that when, if you're affi affiliated with a Greek organization, you have a better memory of good experiences and a better social network, sure. and you're that much more likely to donate to your college in the future because you have fond memories of your experience in Greek life or with other organizations or with the sports teams going to the football fields and the baseball games and stuff like that. And so they have to have those because that's what that really locks in a student's and alumni's perspective of that university and having those sports every weekend after you're an alumni to watch and support your school See, when that donor calls up and says, hey, are you ready to donate and make a gift to your university? You know, you're more compelled to do so. So it has to go back to donations, which brings Absolutely. up my third point about colleges, which is take a guess at how much 
the executives, the chief executives, the trustees make at some of these universities? Now, let me, let me, let me turn that question back. What's a really good salary for an executive at a company? Ooh. Well, it depends what kind of company you're at, but I mean. Pick any I mean, company. You, you could be in the millions at the big multinational companies. If you're looking mm -hmm. at a, a normal sized company, you should be in the hundreds of thousands, at least in a base salary. And then you obviously have. I, I would say, you know, like I would say you could be an executive at most companies for $200,000 or more. True or false? At $200,000, you're like, oh, right. shit, you're, you're making it. You're not just a manager. You're like a vice president or better. Uh, you should be more in most cases, I would say. You'd yeah. be surprised. Take a look down at the breakdown. You'd be surprised at how much <laughs> a lot of executives get paid. And you can look this up information and up in Glassdoor because it, it, it's surprising how little some companies pay. You know, unless you're like okay. CEO, like, for example, the CEO of Costco, how much does he make? You know, I have no idea, but I would hope it'd be seven figures for that guy. $400,000 a year. He, he made a rule that he's never going to get paid more than 20 times more than his lowest paid employee. So he makes 400,000. That's an exception. Most, most executives at that level are in the one to $10 million range or more. If you run a healthcare sure. organization, like if you run United Healthcare Insurance, that dude, uh, a few years ago, I remember seeing something like he had a $400 million paycheck plus a $600 million bonus. So he made a billion, but that was on the very high end of salaries. So but crazy. for the most part, most executives are making between two and $600,000. If you're a Wall Street broker or a banker and you, you have a great year, you might make two to five million. I looked this up recently. The top administrators in the United States, the top 50 make over a million dollars in salary and compensation because they also get housing stipend, uh, car stipend, club memberships, expense accounts. Uh, sure. Their kids get free tuition. Um, they pay, you know, the universities pay their insurance, their term life insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So the top guy, I'm looking this up, is a name named Ronald Mactley at Bryant University, which I had to look up Bryant University because I'd never even heard of it. Some like random small <laughs> town college in like the Northeast. His total compensation was $6.3 million. Amazing, right? $6.3 million. So now at this point, it's like, what's the purpose of these people? And I looked it up. The purpose is they're supposed to be raising money. They're fundraisers, yeah. right? So if you yeah. pay a guy $6 million, how much does he raise? I don't know what's a commensal. Are you getting a hundred to one return on it? Is he raising $600 million for sure. the school? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. You know, I'm looking at this list and it's got pictures and faces. It's mostly old white men, you know, which makes yeah. sense for the demographic of, of universities. Um, but, but at every university and anywhere down to Tufts and California Institute of Technology, these dudes are making a million dollars plus. Uh, and and you know, if you look at the board of trustees and stuff, most of those guys make $300,000 plus. Even trustee, yeah. I remember hearing about Lee Bollinger at Michigan. He left Michigan to go to like Tulane or something like that. He went from like 850000 to $1.7 million. Nice right, upgrade, Michigan, right? <laughs> which, is, which is an incredible thing, which makes me think, shit, we've probably got to the wrong careers. How do we become college administrators to make 300000 plus, even if you're just a bad one, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, and now, you know, when you look down the, the number, I'm at the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, website and they down, you can buy these reports for like 250 bucks, but they give you quite a bit of information anyways. They're saying for every $1 million in the, in the Institute's expenses, 43,000 is just his salary. Damn, that's too much. Yeah. That's, that's, that's over 4% of an organization with tens of thousands of people goes to one person. Oh yeah. Well, you look, I mean, all the big universities too. I mean, these, the, the professors also, there's some serious money being pushed out for professors across the major departments. There's a lot of money in higher education. It all leads to the cost of it is really expensive for Americans. I mean, it's, I think I saw something about like that America spends more per college student than every other country except for like Luxembourg for some reason. I don't know why. I'm not yeah. sure why Luxembourg is the one, but yeah, but I mean that, just the amount of money we spend per student is, is, is incredible as a country. So anyway, so, we, so we're getting to the point that the people that work at universities are paid a lot. They always have yeah. to build nicer buildings. The extracurriculars and the Constant sports funding. programs, except for at the biggest universities where the revenue from the ticket sales and merchandise can match the expenses, is, is a losing proposition, except for the fact that they get donations on it. Even with my kids, you're right. Uh, you know, I'm pushing for them to find out what they want to do because college is now too expensive to spend four years at or five years at to figure out what you want to do. You really should yeah. be going to college and saying, I plan on being an engineer or I need to be an architect 
or I'm going to yes. be a doctor or a lawyer, yes, go to college. But if you're going for a general degree because you need to figure it out, it'd be cheaper to give you $20,000 and say travel the world for a year and meet some people yeah. and have some experiences and figure out what you want to do. Spend some time chanting in a cave with some monks or you know, going on a long walk in, in Australia, whatever you need to do to figure it out or read a few books you know, because to spend time at college, it's, there's a lot cheaper ways to have fun, experience the world, figure out what you want to do. Um, and that's what I know I'm pushing my kids for is like, if we can't figure out what they want to do by the time they're done with high school, I'd rather just give them, them some money on, out of their college funds that I've been funding their 529 plans and sure. say, let's sign you up for a university or some study abroad programs in Hong Kong or Croatia or Central America, just so you can have some world experiences and get some variety of experiences so you can figure out what you want to do because it's too expensive to be stuck in a dorm room taking classes that you might not care about if you don't know what you want to do with your life. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. A, a four-year undergrad degree doesn't have much value to a lot of companies nowadays. What they like is they want to see experience. And you're right. People that have world experience, that, that you know, people that actually have skills that have actually been tested in the real world, that's much more relevant to a co company than just saying you have a degree at a college. Um, and that's, I mean, that's where I can see that there could be an alternate path down the road where companies start recruiting people instead out of high school and you maybe have a longer internship or apprenticeship type program with a company. And then maybe that company sends you to a, you know, a, a specialized, you know, two year program where they feel, okay, this is where we see your path long-term, whether it's an engineering or some computer science type major or, or you know, or business or whatever that is. Um, because yeah, I think it, it's just, it's, you know, especially when, the amount of resumes that are pushed to different recruiters now, there's just not a lot to differentiate between people coming right out of college. Everyone just has a degree. When you have someone that actually has experience, that person definitely stands out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, you, you know this as well as I do in terms of reviewing. You want to see people that, that have been through the fire that know what they're doing and then you can hire yes. them, not someone that's got a business administration general degree. And you're like, and then what? You, you, you know, yeah. like, you know, that's why, that's why even back then it was so important to see leadership positions within clubs and extracurriculars and, and being involved with the, the campus. Cause that shows that you're not just an academic or you didn't just sit there and do some books yes. um, because you know, at the end of the day, you could find the course outlines for any classes that you're interested, go to the bookstores, buy the books. You could probably even crash the, 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 uh, the lectures, you know, whether, whether that's allowed or not, you could probably get away with it in some of these lectures halls that are 200 to 500 people. And if you really wanted to hear it from a professor or a TA, then great. But at the end of the day, if you can crunch through a book, um, you should be able to learn the concepts and, and you know, figure out what you need to, to, to figure out so you can be good at this, right? You're going to see this a lot with as, as tech and engineering and, and science and, and uh, type jobs are more relevant um, that maybe formalized sit in a study hall, lecture hall uh, is the best way of, of learning. It might not be. It might not be the best way to learn and get good experience in doing this. So it's interesting because like I mentioned earlier, I think organizations, most organizations, their number one goal is self-preservation. How do we yeah. stay relevant? How do we keep growing? How do we keep attracting people? And so that's why colleges put out all the stops to make sure students have a good experience, crank out movies, whether they support them or not, national lampoons, dorm days, sorority raid, whatever <laughs> it's going to be, you know, because it's still showing the current generation of kids that going to college is fun and it's a wild time and you got to go. Yeah. And even if it costs your parents or your own student loans that you're going to be on the hook for $60,000 a year, $250,000 over the course of four years, well, it's worth it. They're selling an experience. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why that will probably be a luxury because when you get, when you, you get to the point where college is going to be, you know, reaching the point like, okay, my, 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 my financial advisor, when you first start sending our phone up for our first daughter, he said, by the time she goes to school, out of state tuition in Michigan is going to be for four years, $675,000. And I asked him like, do you realize what you just said? Who in their right mind is going to be spending more than half a million dollars to send a kid to college? Yes. It's just not, not practical. There, ha there has to be some sort of change in the system or it becomes an extreme luxury for most Americans. 
Yeah, you know what's interesting is that uh, several years ago, I think some universities and some some smarter people themselves uncovered, hey, the cost of education is too small. Let's roll out free online classes and things like that. And so a lot of universities have done that from MIT to Harvard to Berkeley's and all these companies, uh, all these uh, universities have rolled out free online classes that you might not get college credit for, but you could go through it and learn the material, right? But what they found yes. out is that, you know, typically at a college you get in 60 or 70 or 80% graduation rates in these online courses, less than 5% of people complete them. They get right? bored. Yeah, I yeah. mean it's online. You're not interacting, and there's no, yeah. there's no, nothing compelling you. No one's paying thousands of dollars for you to finish it, so you don't yeah. have your parents breathing down your neck saying you can't get a C in this class. You got to do better, right? Yes. Otherwise, I'm not paying for your beer fund. Yes. There's no skin in the game. Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, so now it's can you train kids from a young age to learn on their own? And this coronavirus is a prime example. Like, can you have kids sitting at home learning the skills they need to learn uh, on their own to 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 get them where they need to be in life? Yeah. And I've been a firm believer, like you just said it, I'm a firm believer in my entire life that I'm convinced anyone can achieve anything they want in life, regardless of kind of where, what their education level is. You know, it's a matter of someone's, person, someone's, someone's ability to interact with others, to learn, to adapt to their environment, you know, their, their willingness to go out and, and experience new things. And that's, that's be more valuable than just being able to take a test or write a paper. Yeah. So, so, Jason, to sum up, your theory is that college is going to become a luxury good or it's quickly transitioning into one. It is. It is. You know, you hear a lot of politicians arguing to free college. So we'll see if, if that changes. But if not, yeah, it is. It, can be a, it will definitely be a luxury good. I mean, even if it's a free college, they got to figure out a way to make this cheaper because I don't want to shoulder that burden of $60,000 a year per kid. You know, and I don't want to pay. The, I don't want to pay these administrators a million dollars per year or more to do what? You know, to to go schmooze up donors. Let's just turn the cost bases down on everything, right? It's, it's creating an opportunity. Like you see the community colleges and stuff like that, and like they do it. How do? How are they teaching kids for two thousand dollars a year? Yeah, their costs are much lower. It's it's all <laughs> about costs. I mean, but the thing is, the rest of the world has figured this out, so it can be done. There are models that prove this can be done in a very effective way well you gotta you the problem is that you got all these people that are making a million dollars plus guess what they want they don't want to lose that job right they're going to be pushing hard to keep the status quo and and to keep getting their raises because you know when i was seeing these reports um you know several years ago the number of administrators that made more than a million was very small and now that number's like gone up by 20 fold in the last few years as, as the uh uh, impetus for universities to attract top talent for fundraising has increased. They're now paying a bunch of money to get people to come in and, and get them to try to rally their donor base and their foundations to for their endowment of hundreds of millions of dollars and how much they get paid. So it's 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 nuts. It's it's a crazy system. It's what we've got now. Um, I'm hoping there's something better out there for by the time our kids go to school because neither of us wants to pay six hundred thousand dollars per student per kid. Because no. I will be able to. Yeah. No, it, no one will be able to. It's not going to be possible. I no, agree. I mean they're saying that it's going up at pretty much the same rate as healthcare costs, which is roughly sixteen percent a year, right? And if yeah. you figure, you know, regular inflation is one to two percent a year. You know, sixteen percent, like on the rule of seventy-two, that means every four and a half years the cost of tuition doubles. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. I, I just can't stand the idea of spending over 100 grand a year for tuition. It doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, it's, it's tuition plus housing, but either way, yeah. it, it, does, it still doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So we got, we got to find a, a different way out for our kids before. <laughs> yes. so we, got, we got about 13, 14 years to plan this out, don't we? Yeah, it will come on as fast. But hopefully, I, mean, I think a lot of people are thinking about this. It's not just you and I, thankfully. So I, I'm. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that there will be some solution at some point in the next decade because, you know, it'll come to a breaking point if someone's going to have to do something. Well, the, the, this come, brings up my next theory is like, what are you going to do with all these abandoned universities now? <laughs> 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 Especially now with coronavirus, you know, we might shift learning indefinitely. We might not be able to pack study, you know, lecture halls with 200 plus people at a time, shoulder to shoulder, bumping elbows, dropping pencils, et cetera, et, sure. et cetera. I'm sure they'll all become Amazon facilities as Amazon continues to expand. That's true. They need some more warehouses. Well, Jason, yeah. I appreciate you coming on my show. You just listened to another episode of I've Got a Theory with Hanish Polko. Please comment, like, and subscribe. I'd love to hear what other viewers have to say about college. 
and uh, the college experience going forward. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Adish.